गुड इवनिंग गाइस कैन आई जस्ट हैव योर थम्स अप इफ द ऑडियो विजुअल इज वर्किंग वेल व्हिच मींस यू कैन सी मी यू कैन हियर मी एंड यू कैन सी मी राइटिंग हेयर ऑन द बोर्ड सो आई होप द ऑडियो विजुअल इज ऑल ओके just give me a thumbs up so that i know that you guys are in and uh, everything is comfortable fair na fair na all right so perfect na so i think everything is okay and uh, we are all good to begin the session for today so let me quickly introduce myself to you i am dr mukul mohendra your orthopedic instructor here at an academy and this is a session you know that specially been designed to give you an insight into the image based questions why specifically the image based questions you know i have chosen for this session because what my experience has been uh, well good evening bara what my experience has been that you know over the past few years what i have observed with the pattern of this exam that there has been an exponential rise in the number of images specifically that are now a part of your exam so suppose there are 10 orthopedic questions what i have observed with it that at least 8 or 9 out of them tend to be images so in order to make sure that you know you get into the habit of identifying the images and picking up these questions with these this particular session has been kept specially for you good evening Larry, good evening, Bharat. So, so I can see all your comments up. So, you guys are all in. So, I think we are just good to go, and I think we can start up with this uh, easy one. So, shown below is an open fracture here, and this is the knee area. So, this is the distal femur. And you can see this bone coming out of the wound here almost. So, you have to tell me that this would fit in into which grade of open fracture. I'm sure you must have heard of something like Gastillo Anderson classification for open fractures. So you have to help me now as to this particular injury would best fit into which grade? Grade two, three A, three B, three C. So people who are online, please put your choices in the text box, chat box. Very nice. So there's a vote for choice D. Sarika is voting for. Choice C, but then again more votes for choice D. All right. So maybe maybe I'll take the answer of the house to be grade three C. But I would tell you uh, what is my opinion on it. All right. So as far as you guys would be knowing, because more more people you know are voting towards grade three uh, C. I'll share my opinion. Now you guys very well understand that Gastillo Anderson classification is the system we use to classify open fractures. Now, by this classification, we have three grades: grade one, grade two, and grade three. Now, this grading basically is based upon size of the wound. So, what you find in grade one that the wound size would be like a puncture wound, less than one centimeter. So, just a kind of a puncture wound, like if you see here. Now, when you go to this grade two category. the size of the wound would be somewhere between 1 to 10 cm but when you go to this grade 3 category the wound size would become much larger and it would almost always be crossing more than 10 cm so first you know roughly the size of the wound tells you that we are moving towards which category now within this category 3 there is a division like 3a 3b 3c so what you have in 3c that there would additionally be a vascular injury requiring a repair in addition to a fracture now if you see here the distal pulses have been mentioned to be palpable clearly written that the distal pulses are palpable so 3c is out of the question because in this question the pulses are palpable in 3c need to have a vascular injury so that means we are likely between 3a and 3b because if you look at this picture you can very well make out that the wound size certainly seems to be more than 10 cm so so 
eventually I cross out choice A also. So I am stuck somewhere between these choices. Now how to differentiate between 3A and 3B I will tell you. Now if it is 3A, some soft tissue covering on the bone has to be present. Take like the immediate soft tissue covering on the bone is periosteum. So you will at least find periosteum to be intact. But when you go to 3B, there is no soft tissue covering left on the bone. Even this periosteum is basically disrupted. So in a very simple way, because the periosteum is also stripped and gone, the bone is pretty much visible. Here the visibility of bone will not be there exactly, totally naked, because, because at least periosteum covering will be there on the bone, but here there is no soft tissue coverage on the bone. So if I go out here, you can see the bone is protruding out. So soft tissue is disrupted. So that is why I will take exactly this as the grade 3 B. This becomes my answer. So are you guys now clear with this? Sandeep clear? It's not 3A, it is 3B. Because, because the bone is out of the uh, wound, so the periosteum would have also been disrupted. So, so that's how you take the call, you know, when you go by this very popular Gustlo Anderson classification, a classification system that helps you to classify open fractures. Fair enough, guys? Fair enough? Clear with that? Clear with that? Well, uh, basically the idea behind this classification is to guide you on the treatment part. See, when you go to grade 1 and grade 2, these are the scenarios where the treatment option is internal fixation. But when you go to higher grades, the treatment option rather shifts to external fixation. So this is basically the purpose behind this classification to guide you on the mode of fixation, internal or external. But we'll talk about these fixations maybe a little later. But more focus today is on these images. So I hope you've had a good look at these images. You're having a good look at these images and you're preparing yourself to deal with these images in the exams. All right. So you have to tell me the commonest nerve that will be injured in this fracture that is shown over here. So this is the humerus and this is the lower end of the humerus that has sustained a fracture. So you have to help me out guys as to what do you think would be the likely injury. Well, well she was given immediately his answer AIN, anterior interosseous nerve. Hello Shri. Yes, you are right, Larry. Internal fixation causes infection in open fractures, but you know, that's a full topic in itself. Maybe we'll talk about those things later. What's internal fixation? What's external fixation? A uh, little beyond the scope of this. Okay. Okay. So, so we'll be talking of that up. Okay. Shiv says A and Sadika says B, radial nerve. So there are some choices, uh, some proponents that say radial nerve, some proponents that say anterior retrocious nerve. Okay, Shri also says AIN. So, so there's a very divided house I can see. So most of the people are, you know, stuck between these two choices, radial nerve and AIN. Fair enough, fair enough. I'll tell you guys. I'll tell you. See, I'm happy no one has answered PIN, posterior interosseous nerve, because this is a fracture in the arm. And, and there is no posterior interosseous nerve in the arm. PIN is the continuation of radial nerve in the forearm. So this is a nerve that is in the forearm, not in the arm. So this is out. Fair enough. So I am left between these three choices. Now my answer here would have actually been radial nerve. Because what I have shown in front of you specifically, it's the Holstein Lewis fracture. That's the exact definition for this fracture. See. Hosteel Lewis tends to be a fracture that involves the junction of the upper two third and the lower one third of humerus. So that's the specific, you know, area where you have this fracture, this upper two third and this lower one third. Now, almost in like 90% of these cases, you would you know eventually find that there is a radial nerve palsy although that's transient temporary but but this palsy involves a number of cases when this particular area has the fracture 
So since this is Holstein Lewis, the answer here is radial. Now, so many people are you know, answering it as PA and posterior interosseous nerve, uh, anterior interosseous nerve. So can I just ask these people, like what was the diagnosis in your mind? That you were calling this as, uh, as, as anterior interosseous nerve injury case, like, 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 like Shri. Uh, you were one of those ship you were one of those so so why were you guys thinking that, that likely this is uh, a case where anterior interosseous nerve will be injured why were you thinking this like why were you thinking that uh, the injury would likely here be to the anterior interosseous nerve like what was there in your mind as the diagnosis certainly it wasn't all Lewis in your mind otherwise you guys would have ticked uh, radial nerve so 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 what was there in your mind can i just get to know that Yes. Yes. All right. I'll tell you. AIN guys is generally injured when you know we are dealing with fractures supracondylar humerus. Now, if fractures supracondylar humerus has to be talked of, I hope you can see this oliconon fossa. So in fracture supracondylar humerus, the fracture line goes through oliconon fossa. So somewhere here would be the fracture line. So this is not supracondylar humerus, this is it. So if you were thinking that this is fracture supracondylar humerus, you were wrong. Fracture supracondylar humerus, I hope you can see this oliconon fossa. This area would have the fracture line. So when it is... <coughs> So when it's fractures supracondylar humerus, that is where you have to keep the possibility for injury to anterior interosseous nerve. Clear, clear Sarika, clear with that, clear Shri. And please, there is no anterior interosseous nerve in this area. There is no AAN in the arm. Still in this fracture, I am talking of injury to AAN, I will tell you why. I will tell you why. At the PG level, sometimes you are asked, the second most common nerve injured in the supracondylar humerus fracture. So I hope you can now make out this is fracture supracondylar humerus where the fracture line is almost traveling through the tolicanon fossa here. Now when you will try finding the answer to this, you will find the answer here is also radial nerve. The second commonest nerve injured in this fracture. Now please, what you have in the arm is actually the median nerve traveling here in the front it's the median nerve AAN is a branch of median nerve in the forearm median nerve itself is seldom rarely injured even if it is injured it is the AAN branch of the median nerve actually the commonest nerve injured in fracture supracondylar numbers rather if something is to be injured in the arm itself in this fracture it will be radial nerve and tell you the reason why with these wonderful diagrams. See, this is the fracture supracondylar humerus. This is that big muscle at the back. This muscle is the triceps. And triceps will have a tendency to pull this distal fragment posteriorly. So posterior displacement is what you tend to get in this fracture. Now this proximal fragment would have a tendency to, you know, kink the median nerve here. Because this nerve in the front here is the median nerve. Now please just see, this is this median nerve I have shown in front of you, that is traveling in front of the humerus and somewhere here you are going to have that fracture supracondylar humerus through this fossa. Now when there will be a movement between these two fragments, this nerve is bound to be kinked over here. Now this nerve gives a branch here that travels under this muscle pronator teres that I've shown over here. And this branch is the anterior interosseous nerve branch, a branch of the median nerve. Now, AAN is a pretty fixed nerve. It is fixed specifically at its origin here. It is fixed at, along its course under this muscle pronator teres. So when this median nerve is kinked over here, this AAN 
gets a pull and being fixed at its origin being fixed under a muscle it cannot stretch it tolerate a pull so this is a traction injury that AIN gets so that is why AIN tends to be most common nerve injured by traction injury in this fracture supracondylar humerus so what has been asked over here is second most common second most common so second most common gets radial nerve why radial nerve because this is the radial nerve going in the front okay the radial nerve lies in the front in front of the lateral epicondyle so when there will be a fracture over here through the soliconon fossa this fragment will go back this fragment will go in front it could also damage the radial nerve in the front so median nerve will escape because this nerve is bound to be flexible it's not fixed unlike you know pretty much the AAN branch that is relatively fixed so in fracture supracondylar humerus most common it is AAN involved and second in the line is radial nerve okay if you talk of median nerve injury the median nerve itself rare and the reason is very clear to you because it's relatively a mobile nerve the injury to an is traction injury so the traction will be tolerated by median nerve because it's a mobile nerve so are you guys clear with this exact concept that what nerves are injured in fracture supracondylar humerus also guys so are you guys exactly clear with this sarika barat lari nandini shiv uh, can i can i just have the thumbs up if you understood exactly what's happening over here in this okay so so there is no pan in the arms i'm not talking of pan injury but there is no an also either in the arm but still i'm talking of an injury in this fracture supracondylar humerus because it's a traction injury Okay, and median nerve would have a tendency to escape because it's a mobile nerve from a traction injury. Radial nerve can be damaged in fracture supracondylar humerus rarely, but radial nerve would more commonly be damaged in this Holstein-Lewis fracture. And just to add to your knowledge, guys, if you have a fracture around the surgical neck of humerus, it will be the axillary nerve that will be damaged in surgical neck fractures. And in case you have the upper shaft fractures in the humerus the nerve that lies in the upper third here it is the musculocutaneous nerve so this nerve will be injured in the upper third, third humerus yes yes sarika here you will have musculocutaneous nerve injury so right up here in the shoulder area axillary nerve is at risk in the upper third musculocutaneous nerve is at risk in the lower third radial nerve is at risk and in this distal supracondylar humerus fracture the AIN branch is at risk from traction injury so i hope you're exactly clear with the four different nerves that can be injured in a single bow depending upon the level of the fracture so are you guys comfortable with this part are you guys comfortable with this part can i just move forwards now you're clear with all these concepts you're clear with all these concepts clear with all these concepts Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. All right, okay. So now another, another uh, very nice question, one of my favorite ones, okay. Uh, so shown below is a picture here. And, and a patient has sustained some kind of a fracture over here. Okay, Simbu says axillary nerve. Yes, uh, uh, Simbu, axillary nerve will be injured in uh, fractures surgical neck because axillary nerve tends to wind around the surgical neck of humerus. Okay, fine. Now there is a plaster shown over here and looking at this plaster you have to tell me that what likely could have been the fracture in this patient. Okay, so so more so people are inclined it towards this that this is a scaphoid fracture. But it also Sandeep says that possibility for a coli fracture is also there with this plaster which I would disagree glass holding glass holding so 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 more votes towards scaphoid fracture because people are thinking that, that this gentleman 
is having a cluster that's been given in the uh, position that you call as the glass folding position uh, same who please just pay attention here if this gentleman has to hold a glass the thumb has to have some kind of a movement i kept a glass for for the demonstration with me so if i have to hold this glass you know my thumb has to have a movement you 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 fix my thumb totally and you just ask me to hold a glass with my fingers it will be very difficult so this is not a glass holding cast please I know you guys are very much familiar with this fact that safer fractures are known for this glass holding cast and that is what the examiner has exploited here. The answer here is actually a Bennett fracture. Because what you can see is not a glass holding cast, it's a thumb spiker cast. If you see this thumb, what you would find that entire thumb is incorporated into the cast so that's why i'm calling it a thumb spica class and this is what you would give for a bennett fracture which tend to be an intra-articular fracture that is generally oblique shaped and involves the base of the first metacarpal so that's what exactly a bennett fracture is it's an oblique shaped intra-articular fracture that will be involved in the base of the first metacarpal here the metacarpal of the thumb so i have given this thumb spica cast for that incorporation now if you would see a scaphoid fracture cast that you guys know as the glass holding cast that you give for this fracture scaphoid this is what you are going to find with the thumb the thumb interphalangeal joint you would find would be left free it would not be incorporated if it's a glass holding cast now this gentleman can hold a glass because he can move the tip of the thumb he can move his thumb to get that grip please Coley's cast is absolutely different from this please don't answer it even here because what you tend to find in Coley's cast, the pattern is hand shaking position. That's very different from what you see over here. So here what you would have would be a palmar flexion at the wrist. And here what you would rather find is a medial deviation at the wrist in hand shaking cast that you give in Coley's fracture. Because what you would find in glass holding cast is absolutely opposite. Rather than medial, it's a lateral deviation you have at the wrist and rather than palmar flexion, it is a dorsiflexion that you find at the wrist. So handshaking is given in Coley's and, and, and glass holding is given in scaphoid. And can you see in Coley's thumb totally free? The whole thumb has been left free. So guys, please understand. If we have to apply a plaster, we follow a rule of two. I'll tell you what this simply means. That we immobilize one joint above the level of injury, which means one joint proximal to the level of injury, and one joint below the level of injury, which means one joint distal to the level of injury. This is the basic principle of all plasters, most plasters, I would say 90% of the plasters. Now you can very well imagine, if the thumb metacarpal has a fracture, you will be immobilizing the interphalangeal joint. So thumb spica in Bennett's fracture. In glass holding cast, scaphoid wrist has the fracture. So I have immobilized this metacarpophalangeal joint in the thumb. I have gone one joint above. So why immobilize the interphalangeal joint? So IP joint left free. And if I just go to Coley's, Coley's cast would be given for a fracture at the distal end of the radius. So it is radius that has the fracture. So wrist is immobilized. So why immobilize the thumb? Set it free. Because I just have to go one joint distal. That's it. Clear? So I hope you guys have exactly understood that you know the extent of the plaster would simply tell you 
which bone has the injury if you know this rule of two and i hope you have exactly understood how these three fractures would have the different terminal extents for their each fractures so are you guys clear with this part also clear with this part also and yes 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 you have just stolen my 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 question dear unpredictable there was a question in the nict paper that if you are applying a colis cast what would be the the series of your steps so first we give traction and we take the hand in pronation and then we give palmar flexion and then we go with medial deviation so this is the order in which you know we perform those movements to finally bring the colis fracture back to its place clear with this so please do remember this order because there was a question in the nict paper and you have to arrange up these steps in the pro proper order for applying a colis plaster all right and you have to tell me the incorrect statement regarding dislocation of the ligament the teriathomas sign you see on x ray tends to be diagnostic is this incorrect dislocation is more easily recognized on lateral view not on ap view is this incorrect median nerve involvement can occur is this incorrect lunate usually dislocates anteriorly is this incorrect so you have to tell me what is not correct out of the four statements so have a read guys and take your pick this bone here would be scaphoid and this bone here would be lunate so this is a question on dislocation of this bone lunate so please tell me the incorrect statement out of the choices that are given in front of you so which statement you think is incorrect concerning this this topic in dislocation of lunate i suppose you guys are familiar with this topic all right so ahmed lari says that median nerve involvement can occur that's not correct okay so so you guys are not familiar then with the with the the uh, topic see if you talk of wrist dislocations there are two types of dislocation that you may have at the wrist one is lunate dislocation and the other one tends to be what we call as a perilunate dislocation so what you would find with the lunate dislocation that it will be lunate that dislocates out of the carpus but what you would find with the perilunate dislocation that lunate will be staying at its place lunate will not dislocate it will be other carpal bones that dislocate out of the carpus so lunate dislocation lunate dislocates perilunate dislocation other carpal bones except lunate dislocate out of the carpus now apart from the definition identification of these injuries is very important from the x rays so please just see what is the normal scenario when you look at a lateral view of the wrist you will find this distal radius lunate lunate half moon shaped bone and the carpal bones all in one line now you trace the distal radius you can't see lunate with the radius it is lunate dislocation you trace the distal radius you see the lunate is with the radius other carpal bones are not it is perilunate dislocation i'll just show you so i will trace this distal radius for you here and this bone here is half moon shaped lunate now you can very well see this lunate is with the radius the other carpal bones are not with the radius so i'm calling it as perilunate dislocation because lunate is in its place but if i show you the other picture i'll trace this radius for you this bone that is marked over here is the lunate the half moon shaped bone so with the radius lunate is not there these are other carpal bones in line with the radius so lunate is out so this is lunate dislocation 
so I hope you guys can now easily pick up from the x-ray which is a case of lunar dislocation and which is a case of perilunar dislocation more common out of the two generally tends to be perilunar dislocation and these dislocations are known to involve median nerve in both these dislocations now if you see this lunate dislocation clearly again you can see that with this lunate you can imagine as if you know you are pouring some tea into a cup that has been kept over here so Sarika has given you that exact hint so what you see in lunate dislocation is spilled tea cup sign so this is that spilled tea cup sign so if I go back to these choices lunate usually dislocates anteriorly correct because you can see very well here the lunate has gone in front that is happening in lunate dislocation median nerve involvement can occur correct we have just spoken of it dislocation you can easily see on a lateral view yes now you can see the lateral view terry thomas sinus diagnostic is the incorrect statement because terry thomas sign is not what is diagnostic what you see over here is rather the spilled teacup sign so that was the catch terry thomas sign yes i must also then tell you as to what exactly is the terry thomas sign so guys this is a sign that is very different from what is being talked of this is something you will see in a scapholunate ligament rupture see between scaphoid and lunate there is a ligament now orthopedics is just not about fractures and dislocations you know you also have ligament injuries that are parts of it so sometimes even this ligament can be ruptured and gap will appear between scaphoid and lunate this gentleman terry thomas was a comedian who had a gap in between his incisors he was a british comedian he was popular for that you know appearance so this is what has given <coughs> this simile to this sign terry thomas sign so this is a sign of scaphoid ligament rupture it's not exactly a sign of lunate dislocation so that's how the answer here so I hope you are clear with this topic also, fairly good enough. Now there is a fracture that you can see over here in this image and if you see in this fracture this bone fibula seems to be totally intact. There is nothing wrong with the fibula but if you will just have a look at this tibia, lower tibia, you will find a spiral fracture that is involving the lower third of tibia so there's a spiral fracture in the lower third of tibia i hope even in this area you can see that fracture but this bone fibula is totally intact there is no injury down the fibula so you have to tell me the best term to denote this fracture green stick fracture okay okay Ayu says it's a green stick fracture so we have a vote for a green stick fracture Sarika says it's a toddler fracture Shiv says it's a green stick fracture all right Ahmed says it's a toddler's fracture pretty much all right all right so Shiv says it's a green stick so 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 we are somewhere you know held up between green stick and toddler uh, a and d a and d you know that is where you guys are uh, are basically jumping so let me tell you guys uh, the problem with an MCQ a dual edged sword students who are attempting the MCQ tend to think that MCQ is far easier than theory questions because these choices refresh your mind and give you some kind of a hint on the answer but an examiner a smart examiner takes the advantage in a different way he knows I can put close choices and I can confuse the students so don't take an MCQ nicely in case you're dealing with a smart examiner he will always put some choices that will be lowering and will be caught up and you will eventually stuck up between those two or three choices that will be the decider for your result I'll tell you this is not a green stick fracture please 
this is the classical toddler's fracture seen in toddlers only okay because only in small toddlers children you can have this kind of an injury where the tibia sustains a big injury but the fibula remains intact because bones in children tend to be very plastic elastic i would say so 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 this is toddlers fracture now why i'm not not calling this as a green stick fracture i must tell you see children are known to have two very special fracture patterns exclusive to them a green stick kind of a fracture pattern and a torus kind of a fracture pattern now green stick fractures you would usually find in forearm bones and this would be the appearance now you will observe that one cortex of bone is broken over here but if you see the other cortex it is intact so see one cortex broken but other cortex is totally intact now just like ulna this radius is also a straight bone ulna is straight ideally radius is also straight but if you see here radius is curved so some bending of the bone is visible in that area so when you find only one cortex broken the other cortex intact and some bending of the bone visible in that area that's where you call the fracture as green stick yes it's like a bamboo bending absolutely right now bending is like extremely important part of green stick if you see here no bending is visible so that's why i crossed green stick out of the picture because green stick is like that bamboo so bending has to be there otherwise not uncommon in children is to find torus fractures and what you would find in torus fractures that there will be buckling of a single cortex of bone like i'll just try to focus your attention over here i hope you can see one cortex of the radius or see over here one cortex of the radius is like pressed inside like you press a buckle of a bag 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 has a buckle b u c k l e so buckle you press inside to open a bag so when you find one cortex the bone is pressed inside that is what is the torus fracture but when you find these three features bending of the bone that's a green stick fracture and these are also fracture patterns that you may find in children so i hope you are clear with the fracture patterns that may be there in children you will be able to pick them up identify them up and segregate them up all on the x rays clear enough with those guys and anyone who can help me out with this part that what would be the appropriate treatment for this fracture suppose suppose a small child has come to you with this green stick type of a fracture injury so what do you think is the appropriate treatment one is that you apply a plaster of paris cast as it is or no only one cortex is broken break the other cortex also and then apply the cast or no fix with an intramedullary nail or no in children we are more profound on using these k wires kirchner wires fix with these k wires so can you guys help me know the ideal treatment that you think would suffice here as the best option so what do you think would be the best treatment for this particular scenario yes like what would be the ideal treatment for a case of a green stick fracture yes please just let me know uh, like how you guys have seen green stick fracture getting treated all right so most of you have been witnessing the fracture being treated with the cast that is applied as it is well let me tell you the books differ a little bit this is taken as the ideal treatment for a green stick fracture if you go at least theoretically although most of the times i have also in the habit of giving an in situ cast but that's not the ideal way ideal way is to break the other cortex align the bone in the proper position and then apply the cast that is the ideal method so if this comes up in the mcq you should actually be writing this up that you should break the other cortex and then apply the pop cast please be be a little careful could be a big big boo googly this kind of a question and then you can be in trouble all right so not true about this fracture that is shown over here high mortality union always occurs 
it's actually spondylolisthesis of the C2 vertebra over C3 vertebra and road traffic accidents are the commonest cause for this fracture. So you have to tell me what is not true which means you have to tell me the incorrect statement regarding this and before that you have to give me the diagnosis here like what is this fracture that is being talked of. Yes. So what is incorrect? All right. So most of the people are in the favor of the choice B. Union almost always occurs. What I can get it. But have you guys been able to reach the diagnosis like this particular injury? How would it be better called as? Spon yeah, hangman's fracture. Nandin is absolutely right. That was the term I wanted to hear. This is hangman's fracture. Absolutely right. And hangman's fracture is nothing else. It is simply a spondylolithesis of C2 over C3. So this is certainly correct because that is what is the hangman's fracture. So guys, I think you guys are pretty much familiar with this term spondylolisthesis. So what you tend to find in spondylolisthesis that you would have the upper vertebra that generally tends to slip forwards over the lower vertebra. Because there tends to be a fracture that involves a very special area within the vertebra that's called as pars interarticularis. So if I'll just show you over here. This is somewhere where you would have the fracture. This area is the pars. So this vertebra is slipping forwards over this vertebra. So this particular injury is called spondylolisthesis. Now if you talk of spondylolisthesis, the commonest level would usually be L4 slipping forwards over L5. Sorry, sorry, not, not L4 over L5, it will be L5 over S1. I, 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 apologies from my side. It would generally be, uh, in spondylolisthesis, the overall commonest level would generally be L5 slipping forwards over S1. Like if you see over here, this is L5 vertebra, this is S1 vertebra, L5 is going forwards over S1. So this would be the most common level. But not uncommon is to have a spondylolisthesis of C2 over C3. Like you can see over here, this C2 vertebra is slipping forwards over C3 vertebra. And C2 vertebra is the vertebra where you have this odontoid process. So that's telling you this is C2 vertebra. So this is going over C3 vertebra. So, so this is spondylolisthesis of C2 over C3. That is hangman's fracture. Now hangman's fracture, the word is a misnomer. There is no mortality in it. So this is the incorrect statement. In fact, union almost always occurs in this fracture and road traffic accidents are the commonest cause. I know you guys tend to associate this hangman's fracture with the, uh, with the, some hanging forensic classes. Well, hangman's fracture, the word is a misnomer. It was incidentally seen in some cases of hanging and wrongly labeled as hangman's fracture. Actually, it's more commonly seen with road traffic accidents. And concerning this mortality part, the space that is available at this area for cord tends to be the highest in the spinal canal. So because there is a lot of space available for the cord, despite the slip, there is no deficit, no mortality. So this is something, you know, that generally tricks you up guys. So I hope you very well understood this whole scenario. Now spondylolisthesis is particularly an injury that is popular for the x-ray sign it shows that you guys know as that beheaded Scottish dog sign. And this is very well visible over here. There's a dog like shadow this dog like shadow visible at the back of the vertebra and maybe you can pick up there's a fracture in the neck of this dog as this vertebra is slipping forward this pars area is fractured so this is beheaded scottish dog sign that mega was talking of so i hope you guys have understood you know what is spondylolisthesis, is what is the commonest level this pars rt intraarticular is that as the fracture l5 over s1 would usually be involved but yes even c2 over c3 can be involved that will be hangman's fracture but hangman fracture has nothing to do with that hanging. It's just a misnomer. There's no mortality in it because of good space available for cord. 
Whether the, in this spondylolisthesis union almost always occurs, though traffic accidents lead to it, but prognosis is very good by and large in most cases. Clear with that, guys? Clear with spondylolisthesis? Now, one of my favorite ones. There's a splint shown below. You can use it in all these scenarios except one. So, which is that particular scenario where the splint is not going to be very useful? Yes. There's a splint <coughs> that's shown over here. This is going to be useful in most of the scenarios except one. So please let me know the scenario where you think the use of the splint is not very advisable. Yes. Axillary crush paralysis. Montage of fractures. Please. This is a cock up splint. And to be specific, I'll call it a dynamic cock up splint. We use the word dynamic in any splint when in that splint some movement is possible. So here movement will be possible because this is a splint, cock up splint, that is given in cases of a radial nerve palsy. Isn't it? A radial nerve palsy would have a tendency to produce this problem wrist drop and if the wrist will drop extension is being produced by these rubber bands the flexion is free patient can flex the fingers by itself so patient will flex the fingers rubber bands will lift it up so movement will keep on happening with the splint so the word dynamic this is a cocker splint that will be in for radial nerve palsy. Now, a crutch paralyzes radial nerve. Saturday night palsy is a very, very popular form of radial nerve palsy. And Montegia fractures are supposed to be associated with PIN, posterior interosseous nerve palsy, which is again a branch of radial nerve. So, all these injuries tend to injure the extensors. So they require a cock-up splint. Walkman's ischemic contracture is of no sense here. Because here the problem is fracture supracondylar humerus leading to compartment syndrome and this generally damages media now. So no role of the splint for VIC cases, least role for VIC cases. Clear with that because this is actually a uh, uh, a case of radial nerve palsy with wrist drop requiring the cock-up splint. See, what you rather give in Walkman's ischemic contracture is rather what we know as the turn buckle splint. The problem in Walkman's ischemic contracture is a contracture. So suppose there is a flexion contracture at the elbow. So in this turn buckle sprint there will be a buckle. This buckle as you rotate stretches a contracture. Like you can see here also. So when you have these contractures around the joint and you want to stretch that contracture up. That is where you use the turn buckle sprint and that is what will be required for a case of BIC not a cock up sprint. Clear? So radial nerve injury, you would rather go with the cock-up splint. And dynamic cock-up splint is the more preferred version because some movement is allowed. See, in case you are dealing with a median nerve palsy. Now this is a nerve palsy that is troublesome to give you this complication, a thumb. So here you have to oppose the thumb. So here we generally tend to advise an opponent splint so that the thumb can be kept in an abducted position. But you can see no movement is possible here. So this splint will be called as a static splint. So I hope you have understood the difference exactly Mega. You have understood what is a dynamic and what is a static splint in an exact way. Where a movement is possible that's a dynamic. Where a movement is not possible it's a rigid plastic splint that is a static splint. And yes. I can no way negate an ulnar nerve palsy case. 
ulnar nerve palsy is best associated with this problem claw hand in clawing you have extension at the knuckles extension at the metacarpophalangeal joints so you have to bend the metacarpophalangeal joints so here we tend to go with what we call as a knuckle bender splint but here also you can see these rubber bands so some movement will be possible so this particular splint will also be labeled as a dynamic splint so i hope you are clear with the three splints we give for three nerve palsies you have understood what is a static splint what's a dynamic splint and you have understood what will be given for a case of a vic would rather be a turn buckle splint where a buckle is attached to stretch a contracture so are you guys clear with all these things yeah mega says so many silly mistakes well that happens but as you practice more and more and as you understand the concepts more perfectly the silly mistakes go away mcqs are all about trying to you know uh, get down your silly mistakes fair enough little bit about the splints for this problem scoliosis also where you have this bending of the spine milwaukee and boston are the popular braces for scoliosis milwaukee brace is a very bulky brace so you will find this brace going till the neck and stretching till the pelvis since it is the bulky brace it gives you the best correction but let me tell you the problem if you ask me the wear time that is recommended for these braces it is at least more than 20 hours per day now wearing such a heavy brace for such a big time is tough so at least it is not the most commonly used brace which tends to be boston brace boston brace the biggest advantage you find is a low profile much simpler it gives you reasonable correction so many surgeons love to prescribe actually the boston brace at least the child wears a little bit do have a good look at these braces because of late lot of questions have been asked about these braces you are right sandeep milwaukee is not commonly used more commonly used is boston because of the lower profile because not many people here are comfortable with such high wear times clear with that fair enough one last question because we just left with 5 7 minutes so one last question in this class will be over which of the following conditions are associated with the painless limb so you have to tell me the choices i hope you understand what is meant by a limb sway of trunk as you walk and generally this signifies some problem in hip joint so hip joint pathologies would generally be associated with you know a limp so when would you find a painless limp okay dr zoom says in congenital dislocation of hip you have a painless limp she also says the same all right all right all right so i'll share my answer with you my answer will be both a and b so guys uh not many of you could get to the right answer so i think that your concept is little lacking see if you talk about a limp that comes in hip joint pathologies it could be categorized into a painless limp or a painful limp now painful limp would have either of the two scenarios either there will be some kind of a trauma some kind of a injury or some kind of an infection like 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 infection septic arthritis in the hip or or a condition called transient synovitis a temporary kind of an inflammation in the synovium maybe because of minor injury minor infection or something please don't underestimate this condition overall this is the commonest cause of limp in children transient synovitis but it's generally due to some unknown reason trauma i'll give you a classical example slipped capital femoral epiphysis scfp an injury to growth plate in children scfp we will take up this topic somewhere else so here you have infection trauma or something leading to inflammation so the limb will be painful now when there is no infection no trauma 
completely other scenarios else they give you a painless link like congenital dislocation of a perthes disease so that is why both of them the answers see the problem in perthes disease it's idiopathic a vascular necrosis that involves the femoral head but in children in this particular age group 4 to 10 years now please strictly speaking there is some some kind of a theory to it it's not really idiopathic attached on the head of the femur here you have a ligamentum teres so running inside the ligamentum teres are blood vessels supplying the femoral head and these are part of the obturator artery system now i think you guys also know that going along the neck of femur somewhere over here you have the profunda femoris artery this profunda femoris artery gives branches that bind around the femoral neck they are called circumflex arteries medial circumflex femoral lateral circumflex femoral and circumflex femoral arteries also go up to supply the femoral head now femoral head has a dual nature of blood supply the funda is that obturator system is the predominant system in children under the age of 4 years profunda femoris is the dominant system after the age of 10 years you can very well realize that this 4 to 10 years tends to be a watershed zone when when one blood vessel is going away the other one is penetrating so with age the obturator system goes away profunda femoris penetrates now because of some unknown reason you know that we really don't understand this transition is not appropriate so a time comes when there is no blood supply in a part of the femoral head and avian happens per this disease so you can see no trauma no real infection so painless limp painless limp painless limp clear with that in fact even if you are going to ask me the treatment for per this disease this is generally what i tell to my students it's a very self limiting type of a condition improves by itself all you need to do is give some bed rest to the child because you know with growth the vascularity will come back eventually and there will be healing and repair so wait and watch is all we follow because this is what is happening in perthes disease the transition of the blood supply is not there clear well as far as the x ray signs are concerned you find a flattened head shaped like a mushroom you find this gauge sign a lytic area in lateral femoral neck you find this whitish line in middle femoral neck these are the x-ray signs and what you tend to find on examination in perthes disease is restricted internal rotation that is the first movement to be restricted followed by abduction they are generally restricted because of the change in shape of the femoral head as it flattens down clear beka earlier perthes was taken as osteochondritis now it is taken as avian of the femoral head in the appropriate most manner in fact osteochondritis is also avian when i talk of osteochondritis tell you what is osteochondritis it is also now avian so avian is the bigger term that encompasses all osteochondritis clear mega and in congenital dislocation of hip the problem is a dysplasia of the hip which means there is abnormal hip developmentally there is a flat acetabulum and a small sized femoral head the head is small in size because there is a delayed ossification in the head and why there is a delayed ossification the acetabulum is flat shallow by nature so since the acetabulum is flat the head dislocates without injury without trauma head dislocates the vascularity of the head will be hampered see in small children what is supplying the femoral head as you just understood are the obturator arteries so head will dislocate this ligamentum teres will be gone the vascularity will be lost so ossification of the head will be delayed so if you are going to see here the affected side this is a flat acetabulum this is normally a curved acetabulum normally you have a big femoral head here there is a small femoral head because this is the problem here but no injury so i am talking of painless limp clear 
So I hope you have exactly understood when do you say painful limb, when you talk of painless limb. So here I have spoken of painless limb in both these conditions. So I have taken this as the answer because either of the two conditions have no involvement of trauma or infection. Clear with that guys? So that's all from my side for today. I am done with it. Because the one hour we were allotted is almost over. So any queries from the area that I have covered today guys? Anything you want to ask or you want? Please let me know. Okay productive class. Thanks for the lovely comments there. I am obliged. So any, any other queries coming to your mind before I can end up the session? Okay, you want me to conduct more image based sessions? I'll definitely try before the NEET PG exam. I'll take your, uh, your your demand up to the administration and ask them to give me more sessions, you know, if possible. But yes, in case you wish to attend more sessions from me, definitely you can go ahead with the plus subscription. We can take up all the benefits. In case you subscribe, 20% uh, benefit is there for the medical PG subscription. Everything is there on the app for the batch you wish to subscribe. Uh, subscribe the FMG aspirants. We have a batch coming up for you 10th of February, a five month batch gearing up for the next exam. And in case you are the next aspirant for the next exam that's coming up, there's a batch for you also, guys. And yes, uh, the people who have their exam just due is in a month. There's a final booster batch also going on, started 1st of February, so you can join it up to fine tune your preparation. So, so that's all from my side. Non-union malunion, I'll take up maybe in another class and, and, and those classes are already there on the platform. So you're a subscriber, you can go and watch. Okay, so there's there's a there, there are also courses going on. Yes. Okay, but yeah, you subscribe and you can watch it everything on the platform. The recorded sessions are also there. Fair enough, fair enough. And malunion, non-union, I'll take up separately in some, some classes. Okay, fair enough. So in case you wish to subscribe, you can use this code from my side and you can get your 10% off. Okay, so wish you all the best. Keep preparing. Good night for today. Catch you up as subscribers on Academy. Bye bye.